Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for the Holocaust Center for Humanities Lunch and Learn program. I'm Alana Cohn Kennedy, the Chief Operating Officer at the Holocaust Center. A live transcript for this program is available on Zoom. For anyone who would like to use it, just click live transcript at the bottom of your screen. The Holocaust Center for Humanity is located in downtown Seattle, just a few blocks from the famous Pike Place Market. The Holocaust Center sits on the traditional land of the Coast Salish peoples. We honor with gratitude the land itself and those who came before us, stewarded the land and remain leaders and activists within our communities. Thank you to all of you who are joining us for today's program, whether you are watching this live or maybe at a later date, we are so glad you are here to learn with us and hear these incredible stories. And there are so many stories. Thank you to everyone who has emailed me with recommendations to share their own stories or to notify me of new books and movies. I'm grateful for this hive of knowledge. At every turn, there seems to be new information to share. Thank you to this wonderful community for your thirst and demand for these stories. And it's because of you that we will keep this content coming. One of the biggest compliments you can give to us is to share this program or one of your favorites with a friend, colleague, or family member. Send them a link to a program or invite them to join you on a Tuesday or share it on your Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn pages and tag the Holocaust Center. This helps others to find our programs. Did you know that our Holocaust Center trains more than 500 teachers in the state of Washington each year? I know that some of you listening to today's program have also attended some of these teacher trainings. Whether or not you are teachers, you know who you are. At these workshops, teachers learn the best practices for teaching about the Holocaust. On September 7th and 8th, the Holocaust Center is offering teacher workshops in Spokane, which will be available both in person and virtually. The programs focus on Americans and the Holocaust and include finding answers to tough questions like, why didn't they just leave? And what did Americans know? There's a special in-person only session with Clarice Wilsey, the daughter of a liberator of Dachau, who will share her father's story as known through the hundreds of letters he wrote home during the war. Clarice often attends our Lunch and Learn programs and is part of our speakers bureau. If you are in the Spokane area, you should definitely take this opportunity to hear her live and in person on September 8th. These programs are geared towards teachers but are open to anyone who wants to attend and you can find out more on our website. There will be a link in the chat. I'm so pleased to have with us today, author Diane Sue to discuss her new book, Remarkable Resilience, which she co-authored with Holocaust survivor, Noemi Bond. Diane M. Sue received her PhD from the University of Michigan, worked as a school psychologist and school counselor, and has taught courses in the education and psychology departments at Western Washington University. Diane has been recognized for her professional and volunteer work with children and families, receiving the Washington State School Psychologist of the Year Award and the Western Washington University College of Education Professional Excellence Award. We will take questions at the end of the program. Please enter your questions at any time through the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Thank you so much, Diane, for joining us today from Bellingham and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Alana. Um, and thank you to all of you who came to hear about Remarkable Resilience and Noemi's story today. Um, also, I wanted to mention I'm also coming from Coast Salish land up here in Bellingham, Washington. So my plan is to share with you a little bit of background information about Noemi, about our friendship, and about the process of writing the book with her. Um, I'll also introduce you to my website, livingwithresilience.com, where you can find more information on Noemi and her family and a variety of discussions questions that are related to the book. Now, I imagine that Noemi's story won't be new for some of you because Noemi really got around with her public speaking. When we started working on the book, uh, just before her 96th birthday, I asked Noemi if she knew how many talks she'd given over the years. 
she wasn't sure. She guessed maybe 200 or 300. And then she pulled out a spiral notebook where she had written down the date and place of every presentation she'd made. It looked like a really long list. So I asked if I could borrow it and take it home to count the number of presentations. And we were both astonished to find that the number at that time was 1222. Um, and she was still agreeing to go wherever anyone invited her to speak. In fact, she continued her public speaking until the day before she went into the hospital with a serious heart condition about four months before her 97th birthday. Those of you who have heard Noemi speak or who have read the book already know that Noemi was an absolutely amazing woman. She was born in Seged, Hungary on September 29, 1922, and her family immigrated to the U.S. a few months after the Hungarian Revolution of 1956. If Noemi were alive, she'd be turning 100 this year and no doubt looking forward to the celebration. I imagine that most of you already know that Noemi was a Holocaust survivor, imprisoned first at Auschwitz-Birkenau in Poland and then at a forced labor camp near Allendorf in Germany, which was part of the Buchenwald complex. You may not know about other parts of her remarkable story. Living and raising two young sons under the communist government of Joseph Stalin or living through the Hungarian Revolution and then escaping into Austria in the dead of winter. Or her experiences when she and her husband and children arrived in the US and settled in Missouri. Or her determination to learn English so she could return to the teaching profession and become a US citizen. You also may not know that she was a full time caregiver when her husband Ernest who was also a Holocaust survivor, developed severe Parkinson's disease and dementia. I first met Noemi in the year she was caring for Ernest, when my youngest daughter was the first student to interview her when she first began talking publicly about her experiences during the Holocaust. Noemi and I became daily walking buddies soon after Ernest's death, and we enjoyed almost 25 years of close friendship. I'm going to share a few slides so you have a chance to learn a little bit more about Noemi, and then I'll talk about how this book, Remarkable Resilience, came to be. So I'm going to um, screen share here. And this is one of my favorite pictures of Noemi. It was taken um, when she was in her late 80s. She was down in the Portland, Oregon area. You probably recognize Multnomah Falls. And she had such a wonderful visit. She came back full of enthusiasm. And um, her friend who helped co-host that um, visit sent me this picture. And again, it's one of my favorites. Um, and so again, I would like to honor Noemi schoenberger Bahn as a Holocaust survivor, also as an escapee from Russian rule, um, as a refugee and immigrant here in the United States, as a loving wife and mother and dedicated, devoted grandmother and great grandmother, um, an educator, an international speaker, and an amazing um, inspirational elder. It was you know, just the last three decades of her life, um, from her 60s through her 90s, she was on a mission. And any of you that have heard her speak know what I mean. So I'll tell you a little bit about Noemi's family. Um, the photograph on the left are Noemi's parents, Shamu and Yulishka. Um, this is their wedding day, December 27th, 1921. Uh, this photograph was taken very soon after Shamu returned to Hungary after um, being in a, a Russian prison for almost five years. He was called to service during World War I, captured um, and spent all that time in the prison. He had just met Yulishka once prior to his imprisonment and um, he remembered her. He um, actually sent her a letter 
from his prison and um, they corresponded for those five years that he was in prison and when he returned to Hungary he was um, determined to find her and um, he proposed to her and she said yes and um, then they got married soon afterward and nine months later Noemi was born. And the photograph in the middle is Noemi with Yulishka. And Noemi was an adorable little one, as you can see. Um, this was taken in 1923. And then um, the photograph on the right um, was from 1934 with Yulishka on the left. And then Noemi, Noemi's younger sister, Erzhebet, and then Shamu on the right. And these photographs, we have them because they were found in the rubble of um, the house that had been bombed in Debrinsen, Hungary, um, when her father escaped from Nazi imprisonment and was back looking for the rest of his family and searching. He did find um, these photographs that have been since restored um, to a, a vision that we can use to um, see them today. A few more photographs um, on the left bottom is Noemi as a young adolescent um, and then Noemi and her husband Ernest, also a Holocaust survivor, um, soon after their wedding. And then the photograph on the right was shared with me um, from, from students uh, in Missouri where she was a teacher. This was one of her um, class photos that had been shared. Um, and that was when she was um, in her um, mid 30s um, to early 40s um, after they had emigrated to the United States. This is a photo of Noemi in her hallway. Um, and as you can see in her hallway, she has pictures of her family, um, both um, her family from Hungary and um, many pictures of her uh, children and grandchildren, special events that were celebrated. And in this photo, Noemi is touching a photograph of um, her mom, Yulishka. The photograph to the right is Shamu um, in his later years. He lived um, to, into his 80s, um, but the two of them together with their wedding photo um, beneath it. And that photograph that she has there is a photograph that Shamu carried with him throughout his life. It's a photograph that Yulishka sent to him when he was in prison. And again, he kept it with him um, in uh, just, it was a very, very beautiful, loving relationship as you um, will see from reading the book or I have much more of their story on my website for anybody that's interested. There was too much to put in the book, but it was a story that I felt needed to be told. So some of the chapters that I needed to remove from the book are right there on my website at livingwithresilience.com. And then here's a photograph on the left with Noemi and her family. Um, this was in Missouri, um, a visit in Missouri. Um, Noemi's son, Steve, Dr. Steve Ban is on the right and um, three of the grandchildren um, and then Ernest on the left with Noemi. And then on the right is a photo of Noemi around the time she and I first became friends. Um, Ernest was already, um, dealing with Parkinson's disease and uh, severely advanced dementia. Um, Noemi always with her smile and full of love with Ernest. And again, just a beautiful picture of the two of them together. And um, soon after Ernest passed was when Noemi and I began spending a lot of time together. I had seen his obituary in the paper. I gave her a call, asked her if she'd like to go for a walk because I knew she loved walking. And um, she and I walked sometimes five, six, seven days a week. Um, and of course, as you can imagine, we had many, many conversations over the years. And, and eventually when she was no longer able to go out lock, walking like we used to, I would come to her house, sometimes pick her up, um, take her somewhere where she could walk with her walker, um, or more often just sit with her in her kitchen, in her living room and um, chat. And um, again, lots, lots of hours um, together with this amazing woman. So soon after Ernest died, Noemi went 
um, she was invited to attend the 50th anniversary reunion of the end of World War II and a reunion of Holocaust survivors. And here you see a photograph of, um, you probably recognize Elie Wiesel, the um, Nobel laureate and educator activist um, who wrote the book Night, among many other books. And um, he was one of the speakers at this event. And his words to Noemi were life-changing. He talked to the group about the importance of speaking about their experiences, keeping the memories alive so we do not forget. Um, not only did um, Elie Wiesel speak at that event, there was also a woman who was sharing some research on Holocaust denial. And Noemi could not believe that there were people going around saying that the Holocaust did not happen. And she returned from that event very determined to share her story. She also returned with the idea that her next step was to return to Auschwitz. And she went on that journey, that first journey, um, in total she returned eight times. Um, but that first journey, she went with um, Dr. Ray Wolpo, a member of um, the local synagogue here in um, Bellingham, Beth Israel, and also a friend of Noemi's and a professor at Western Washington University. And he's also the founder of the um, Holocaust Center and uh, Center for Genocide Studies here in Bellingham at Western Washington University. And Together, they toured Auschwitz. He was there. He witnessed um, what happened um, as she processed going back. Um, he was there when she found the stone that any of you that have heard her speak or have read the book, the heart-shaped stone that she found when she was so exhausted that day she couldn't move forward anymore. She sat down and she spied the stone and she pointed and pointed and pointed until Ray found the correct stone, brought it to her, and it, it was a precious possession for her. She kept it in these porcelain hands that someone from Gonzaga University had gifted to her, um, and that's the stone in the center. And on the right is a, um, a candid photo of Noemi during one of the visits to Auschwitz. And you can tell, you know, her memories were so strong being there. You could tell that she was smelling the smell and re-experiencing that trauma. Here are a few more um, photos of, again, from her different visits. Her second visit back to Auschwitz was um, on the left, she's there with her son Steve in the middle and uh, her granddaughter Julia on the left. And then on the right is a photograph of Noemi um, talking to Julia. Um, happier times, they were sitting in Budapest and she was having a chance to show beloved Hungary uh, to her granddaughter and introduce her to um, Budapest and hung Hungary and Hungarian way of life. And then um, as Noemi visited, whenever she was able to go back to Budapest, she visited this dear friend. Um, her name is Lily. Um, you'll read about her in the book. Uh, Lily was uh, a Holocaust survivor, although something that they had never spoken of. Um, and Lily was an important person in terms of uh, Noemi's determination to escape Hungary after the Hungarian Revolution and being in the midst of all the fighting in downtown Budapest and um, determined, um, particularly as anti-Semitism was becoming more apparent in those days of chaos, um, determined to make sure her sons were safe and out of Hungary. And um, Lily was the one who had the idea of uh, the plan that finally allowed them to escape. And so um, she always had a special place in Noemi's heart. And you can see from this picture how much they loved each other. Um, after returning from Auschwitz, Noemi and Ray Wolpo um, went and spoke about the return in many uh, different venues. This happened to be from Western Washington University, um, where the banner on the top says Holocaust survivor returns to Auschwitz-Birkenau. Um, also, uh, Noemi was asked many times if she had a book. 
And so she worked very hard um, with uh, assistance from Ray to write a short memoir, um, really meant for children, very specific to her Holocaust experiences. And the name of that memoir is Sharing is Healing, a Holocaust Survivor's Story. Um, and at the bottom, you'll see a gift of love and understanding from Noemi Bon. Um, and this book, just to let you know, is now um, an open access. So it's available on the website at Western Washington University. Um, and Richard, the tech host today, will be putting some information on that later on in the chat. Also, there are videos of Noemi speaking. Um, and certainly, there's also, uh, Noemi has a page on the um, Seattle uh, Center for Humanity um, also on their web page. So all of those will be available for those of you that would like to take a deeper dive and learn a little bit more about Noemi and hear um, in her own words. So Noemi being the person that she was and the um, person who dedicated, again, almost three decades of her life to Holocaust education was recognized in many different venues. This photograph on the left happens to be her receiving an honorary doctorate from Western Washington University. Um, very special day. Um, that actually happened to be her second honorary doctorate because Gonzaga University also honored her about five years prior to this um, with another honorary doctorate. Um, on the right, another um, celebration of Noemi and all that she did for Holocaust education. Um, one of, again, one of my favorite pictures. Um, and then this photograph here, you'll see Noemi. Um, she was invited to Washington, D.C. to give a talk. Um, she was, I have to say, a bit nervous. She'd never been in that kind of an audience, um, such a huge audience. Sometimes her audiences were two, 3,000 people. This was similar, but a lot of people that she didn't know and not from the West Coast. Um, but she was honored there um, by the Daughters of the American Revolution. And um, she received what they um, call their Americanism medal. Um, and you'll see that medal on the right. And it really was quite an honor. Um, she went there with Jim Lortz, another professor from Western Watch Washington University, who was um, a good friend of hers as well. And um, they both enjoyed the event. And then I was lucky enough to hear all about it as soon as she got home. And another part of Noemi's legacy is the family that she left behind. Um, here I have um, photographs of two, uh, her, two of her 10 great grandchildren, the two that she did not have a chance to meet. Um, the little one on the left is um, just an absolute delight, full of energy. That is Grandpa Steve with uh, little Gabor, named after Noemi's brother, who um, perished in Auschwitz. And then on the right is little Illy. Um, she was born about a month before the launch of the book in May, and she came to our book launch. Um, um, both our virtual book launch and our in-person book launch. And um, I had a chance to spend time with both of them a few weeks ago. And uh, Noemi would have been delighted to know both of them. They're just adorable children, as are all of her grandchildren and great-grandchildren. So um, one last photograph of Noemi. This is Noemi on her 90th birthday celebration. Um, her son Steve and uh, daughter-in-law Jan put on a big party at their house. And here was one of the photos that was taken with two of the great grandchildren um, who live in Maine, um, Rachel's daughters. And um, on the right, you'll see the book, Remarkable Resilience. Um, and you'll see that I um, there's a quote from um, Ava Schloss, who I do want to say was a wonderful supporter of this project. I sent her my manuscript early on. She read it. Um, she really wanted it published. I would hear from her saying, you know, how soon is it coming out? You know, let me know. And then she was lovely and attended our virtual book launch. It was wonderful to have her presence there. So again, um, a lot of support along the way. So I'm gonna stop my screen share here and uh, just talk a little bit about um, how the, the book came about. 
um, Noemi and I had been friends for years, and I have to say, I never thought about writing her story. A few people had tackled it, um, a couple people that came and spent a lot of hours with her, and they were going to write her story, and she was excited, and I was excited, and her family was excited, but it just never happened in those cases, you know, the 10, 15 years ago. Um, it just never went forward, and I can say I can understand why, because it is a complicated process. But um, around 2018, a time of a lot of political turmoil, um, Noemi had been paying really close attention to what was happening with Viktor Orban in Hungary and the rising authoritarianism there. And she was equally concerned about the name calling and the divisive political rhetoric that was happening here in the United States. And it was a topic, um, a frequent topic of uh, conversation between the two of us. And she would often say, this feels all too familiar. And then she'd go on to explain what she meant by that. So a few weeks before Noemi's 96th birthday, just out of the blue, I woke up one morning with absolute certainty that I should write a book about Noemi's remarkable life. I was clear that it should be about her whole life, including her life before and after the Holocaust. And so I went over to Noemi's house um, that morning and I told her what I had in mind and she was thrilled. She just kept blowing kisses. <laughs> I just have that vision of her sitting there. She was so excited and she was telling me it would be a wonderful birthday present. Even though I hadn't mentioned her birthday, I think she knew if, if um, it was a, you know, framed as a birthday present, it would be more likely to happen. So she wasn't going to let, let that opportunity go. She kept saying, this is the key. She wanted her story and her message to live on. And um, she had total confidence that I could do it. Um, actually, much more confidence than I had. Um, I am a psychology textbook writer, but I had never written a memoir. And I understood how complex Noemi's story was having um, known her for so long and known so many of the details. Um, and Noemi's big focus was not, can we do it, but how soon can we get started? And literally, we got started you know, within the next couple of days. Um, and so as you might imagine, I knew a lot about her life after almost 25 years of friendship. And fortunately, around 2015, there had been a documentary filmmaker who had heard about Noemi and he had told her he was interested in making a film about her life. And she um, asked me to sit in on some of the phone calls and it was clear um, to both of us that we needed an outline for him to really see all that was involved. And so she and I had worked on that outline for a number of days. We kept remembering stories or events that should be added and the outline kind of grew and grew and that um, film project never moved forward, but fortunately I had kept the outline. And so when it came to writing the book, I had the whole outline of the book right there. And so that's what I used to guide me. And Noemi had a really clear idea of her vision of how it should go as writing the book. She, I talked to her about possibly tape recording and she said, no, no machines. Um, let's just sit down and chat like we always do. And uh, fortunately, she was okay with me taking notes. So I often would leave her house with pages and pages of notes. And then I would go home and dictate them, get them into um, digital format so I could organize them because she would go you know, from one era to another, um, whatever was on her mind is what we talked about. And that was kind of how we organized our work sessions, whatever she'd been reflecting on, whatever popped up for her to say that was important. And then when she was finished talking, I would fill in the gaps because of course I was trying to write a story and I had questions and I needed um, details here and there. And then every time we met, um, we'd look at Noemi's calendar and she'd try to squeeze in as many work sessions as possible. Um, 
And I tried to make sure I didn't overtire her because she was still doing her public speaking and going to her exercise class and doctor's visits, et cetera. Um, so I would remind her that I also needed time to write and to do research. So we couldn't meet every day, but um, we did end up meeting often three or four days a week. Um, and I did do a lot of research. I reviewed all the interviews that had been conducted previously, um, both written interviews and the um, videotaped interviews. I interviewed people who knew her, like her students in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, and then I would write a chapter or two, starting from the beginning of her story, um, bring it to her. You now Amy, being the school teacher that she was, would have her red pen and she'd underline a word here or make a little mark in the margin there. And that would be what she wanted to talk more about, either to clarify or to discuss further, to give me more detail. And she was so excited as she was reading the chapters. She'd say, this is my life that I'm reading about. And I can hardly wait to read the whole book. She was motivated. And so we worked for almost eight months until late May 2019, when Noemi went into the hospital with a serious heart condition. Um, even then, her first question when she saw me as when she was released from the ICU was, are you still working on the book? We need to make this, me being in the hospital, part of the book. She was, again, determined she, you know, any nurse that was there when I was there, she wanted to tell them about the book. Um, it, I know, was really important to her. And so even at the very end of her life, um, Noemi wanted her family's story and her messages to live on. And that's why I'm so grateful to everyone who helped me along the way and for all of you who are here to help spread the word. Um, and those special people include Noemi's family who have been incredibly supportive um, throughout this process. Um, they um, shared uh, her father, Shamu's diary with me. He had written a journal um, that was translated from Hebrew into English. And um, they had a written document that they shared that was incredibly helpful, as well as a journal that he kept um, right after he escaped from the Nazis and was searching for his family and found an old dentist's appointment book that he used to just pour out his heart. And um, that journal also was part of the process that I um, had. I was given that by Dr. Ray Wolpo, who also um, shared his notes with me from his trips to Auschwitz with um, Noemi. Um, and he read the manuscript and wrote the foreword to the book. So again, um, I have such gratitude for everyone along the way um, who helped with the process. So um, what I'd like to do now is just very briefly um, read from the book. I will, um, this, most of the book is written in Noemi's voice. Um, that was the way that it made the most sense rather than third person. But this last is the um, final pages of the book um, that I would like to share it with you. Um, I'm reading from page 246. And um, the Rachel who's mentioned in here is Noemi's granddaughter, Rachel, um, who is one of the speakers at her celebration of life, her memorial at, at the Beth Israel Synagogue here in Bellingham. Rachel went on to share words from, from an essay her oldest daughter had written. I want to make sure we all remember the importance of peace and keep it in our hearts, Rachel explained. My daughter touches on what I feel is the most important lesson to take away from my grandma's life. For a peaceful future, we must continue to tell her story for generations to come. We must teach her messages of love and compassion, of tolerance and acceptance, and always remember to appreciate life. As Rachel spoke, I looked around at everyone gathered at the synagogue family and friends who reflected diversity of age, occupation, and spiritual traditions. The tremendous impact Noemi had on the lives of people in our community was evident. Just as Noemi had an incredible gift for uniting people in life, 
Her passing united those who loved and respected her. What we all had in common was our admiration for an extraordinary woman, a special person who touched our lives, not only with her story, but most importantly, with her loving presence. Many of us recognized that Noemi's mission had silently passed into our hands and that it will be up to us to step forward and share her passionate messages. Although our beloved Amy, Noemi is no longer with us, I have no doubt that many of us will follow Noemi's tradition of honoring her dear ones by sharing her story. I am also confident that those who read this book will help spread her lessons of hope and healing. Together, we will ensure that Noemi's love lives on. So thank you, and um, I will include Alana now. Thank you so much, Diane, for introducing us to Noemi and for this incredible book that you've written that really does such a wonderful job of showcasing her life and, and just how she was really able to um, take such a tragedy and still have a love of life afterwards. And I know some of the people listening in today might not have, um, they might not really know Noemi's story. And so I just, just to give a little background, I just wanna try to explain a little bit why she was really remarkable for so many reasons. And you know, one of the reasons is she had such horrific experiences during the Holocaust, losing her family, which she always referred to as her dear ones. And um, she was in Auschwitz, she was starving, she worked brutally, she later endured the death march out of Auschwitz. And of her large Jewish family in Hungary, only she and her father would survive the Holocaust. And yet, here is this here is this woman, Noemi, who maintained such a positive attitude during her life. And she had such an appreciation for all of the little things. And she inspired so many with her thousands of talks, as you, as you described. And it just seemed to the rest of us like, if this woman could still have a love of life and be optimistic, then you know the rest of us have the capacity to do that also. And I wanna, um, if it's okay with you, I wanna play just a very short video clip. It's just two minutes long off our website um, that shows Noemi just to illustrate kind of what she went through. It's her, she talks about her arrival in Auschwitz and the last time she sees her family. So we're gonna play that little two minute clip just to help some of the people who are watching today kind of get a sense for, um, just how outstanding this is that she could go through this and still maintain this attitude. And finally, we got done on the ground. We had to line up in pairs. I was standing with my mother who had the little baby in her arm and behind me, my dear grandmother who was hardly standing on her feet and I don't know if she knew where, where she was or who she is and my little dear sister next to her. And then slowly that long, long line start, started to move ahead. Before we started to move forward, they took all the men, the little boys and old men, to another line. So we were only women then. And the line slowly, slowly moved ahead, not knowing where are we going. When finally, as I looked ahead, I did see that the very end of the line dividing for some reason. Well, we still didn't know what happening. What we did see, however, a lot of us as officers, and one of them stood in the middle. And when our turn came, I looked up and I did see a young officer, shiny uniform, white gloves on his hand and a horse whip. When I looked up, I remember him, he signaled to his left. My mother, my grandmother, my little sister and the little baby in my mother's arm 
one more signal, and I find myself on the other side. So I turned around, I remember, I, I, in my mind, I can see them there, and my mother bending forward with the baby in her arm. What her eyes were saying to me was, take care, love you, goodbye. I didn't know that time that I will never saw them again, but I didn't ever. I remember she used to share this story when she would speak um, to audiences all around the country and around the world. And I know she's told her story many times. She wrote her book and then, and you wrote this wonderful book. I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about how your book is different from the book she wrote and kind of what, what makes it unique from um, the other tellings of her story? Thanks for that question, Elena. Um, the book um, really incorporates her whole life. Um, the, the growth after the Holocaust, the processing, her healing from the Holocaust, um, the, her, her telling of that whole process of finding herself again and the story of how Ernest was by her side all the way. Um, so uh, uh, I guess the depth of what we did, and, and again, you know, two sit friends sitting side by side talking um, about very deep feelings through that process. So I think, you know, just that friendship and the depth, um, and always my curiosity about her incredible resilience. Like you said, um, anybody that knew her would know how much she loved life and how she you, used those terrible experiences to propel her forward. Um, as a psychologist, we talk a lot about post-traumatic growth and really that capacity to move beyond from a very difficult experience. But I have never met anyone who's embodied it more than Noemi. She um, definitely um, was someone that appreciated every minute of life. Um, and again, that I love life was something you would just hear her say on a regular basis, um, including the days that we spent with her in the hospital at the end of her life, that appreciation for each extra day that she had. Um, and so this book also um, does incorporate a lot of um, information from her um, father's journals that um, a little bit of that was in her memoir, but this expands it. And then even more so on my website, the chapters that I needed to take out that are available for anybody to look at are there. Um, and so again, just, I think that um, this book embraces Noemi as a whole healed and healing person. Diane, because you're a professional, very um, accomplished psychologist. Can you tell us how um, that line of work is reflected in this book and in your work with Noemi and what kinds of things? I imagine you bring a unique lens to hearing these stories. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, both, both in terms of post-traumatic growth and then the whole um, area of psychology, positive psychology that really looks not at what's wrong with us, but what is right, what helps us thrive, thrive and to flourish. Um, what I attempted to do throughout the book, and because the book is written in Noemi's voice, um, I was not able to call it out directly, but anybody who studies psychology can see um, the elements of grit and perseverance and love of learning and commitment and um, clear, clarity of purpose. 
um, all of those things that we study in um, positive psychology, um, Noemi again embodied. Um, and so um, there was that piece. And then also with Noemi, you know, just following her journey, the video that you showed was very early on in her telling of her story. I remember um, the day that was recorded. Um, she was, um, came home and was doing a lot of reflecting. There were a lot of questions, you know, that particular interview where there's a series of questions with the Shoah Foundation that um, they were hoping that survivors could speak to. Um, and I, um, it, it just, the, the seriousness that you saw in that interview, often uh, Noemi was able to surpass that with love and light beyond that, you know, that was a very serious day. Often her presentations were very serious, of course, because of the subject, but she tried to lighten them with um, as much humor as she could put in. And, and she was usually very effective with that. Um, she also, for me as a professional working in the school with um, many students and families who had experienced trauma, she was always my secret weapon. Um, because I would have students who were going through a lot and I would say, you know, we're, we have this upcoming guest and I would tell them a little bit about her and how she survived and, you know, they were always so delighted to meet her and, you know, often were the folks that greeted her at the door when she came or brought her flowers, whatever it was, to make those connections. But I know I can speak from the students I worked with how much she influenced lives and students that I've heard from over the years, um, you know, that they'll never forget what she what she spoke about. Um, the other piece is Noemi had her own journey in terms of understanding. Um, as a Holocaust educator, she certainly was um, making sure that audiences understood what happened during the, the Holocaust from a personal perspective, knowing how important that was. But she also um, began receiving letters, um, be, began having conversations that, from people that um, heard her speak, and she realized how she was part of the trauma healing process for those people, how she was giving hope. And so she began to expand her audiences. She went to drug recovery centers. She went to our local jail. She went to Monroe prison. Um, the last year of her life, I happened to go with her to one of our, the jail presentations. And there she was, you know, using her walker to get to, into the jail and up the elevator and there to present. And she told her story and there she was with open arms um, for any one of the, um, and it happened to be women prisoners at that moment. Um, anyone that wanted to give her a hug, she was there to give them a hug and to know um, to let them know that there was hope. That's what she wanted, was to, to give everyone hope. Um, and so she deepened in her message. And I think that's also reflected in the book, um, and particularly the last chapter in her voice in the book where she really talks about not giving up. Um, and um, I personally see it as a beautiful guide for trauma survivors, um, particularly those messages in that last chapter. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, she really universalized her message, I think, over the years of one from the story from a Holocaust survivor to something that is that we all can learn from that it has this, um, not just healing, but this optimism that's with it, just an appreciation for every day that we all have a almost a duty to appreciate everything that we are given every day. Absolutely. And, and Noemi would frequently say, trauma is trauma. And I went through trauma, she would say, as a Holocaust survivor, but my trauma was no worse than your trauma. You know, you know, she just, she did not put herself apart from other trauma survivors. She really saw that um, every individual's trauma is traumatic for that individual. She understood mm -hmm. that deeply. Diana, you mentioned this journal that her father wrote, and I'm wondering where is the journal today? And is that, because it's been translated to English, is it something that's available for people who are interested in learning not just more about Noemi, but about the Holocaust and 
and um, his his story, their family story. So um, there's actually two documents. There's the one document that her father wrote in his later years. And um, we don't know the reason why he chose to write it in Hebrew. Um, he, of course, spoke, spoke Hungarian. Um, but when he was imprisoned during World War I, all of the Jewish prisoners in Siberia, in the camp that he was at, they kept, regardless of which country they were from, they put all the Jewish prisoners together. And so during that time, he had a, an opportunity to learn a lot more about written Hebrew and colloquial Hebrew. And so um, Noemi wasn't sure if it was to challenge himself that he chose to write it in Hebrew or whether it was for privacy, you know, it, it's hard to know because a lot of it had to do with his love for Yulishka and the difficulty of those years. Um, but finally, we had a, he, a, a scholar come from Israel to Western Washington University who translated it from Hebrew to English. And so that is in a document that the family has. It's in PDF version. Um, it was before computers. It was like literally typewritten. Um, and so that was one of the documents that I went through from top to bottom. Um, and then the other document um, was a document that um, Ray, in working with Noemi, um, there was the diary that her father had written, like literally tear-stained diary that he was pouring his heart into during those um, days and then weeks and then months where he had no idea what had happened to his family. Um, and it was kind of his survival valve. And so Noemi, um, early in our friendship, had been working on translating that from Hungarian to English. And she it was all handwritten. Um, and um, so that is available, her handwritten part. Um, and for me writing the book, um, particularly some of the parts that are on the website that didn't make it into the Remarkable Resilience book itself, um, for me to make use of that in my writing, what I ended up doing was I took Noemi's translation and I dictated it word to word into a document. So we have a digital document of that. Mm -hmm. And I have to say that was such a challenging task to be reading her father's words that often I could work on it for 10, maybe 15 minutes and I had to stop. Um, and it made me think of how difficult that must have been for Noemi to be translating, seeing her father's written words in Hungarian, writing it out in um, English. And uh, it was interesting when I reflected on, I knew she was translating, I knew she was working on, and usually she talked about everything. She was very verbal. Anybody that knew her would know that. She had been really, she was really quiet about that process and what she was doing. And when I read it word for word, as she'd been translating, I understood, I think it was a lot to process. Um, so again, both of those are um, in the possession of the family. I know there's been some conversation about possibly at some point, at least the document from um, during the Holocaust, um, the, the dental appointment book that are father wrote in, maybe sometime going to a museum um, that would perhaps have that for safekeeping. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it definitely sounds like something that should be preserved. It sounds very painful and heartbreaking, but some a record that would be critical Absolutely. to to preserve for as long as possible. Absolutely. Um, Diane, it, as my last question to you, I was very excited to hear that you are involved with the movement of saging. And um, I think Noemi is really a, a perfect person to exemplify this movement. And I'm wondering if you can tell us about saging and what that is and where people can learn more about it. Okay, thank you. Um, and I think Richard will be putting some information on uh, Saging International, which is the organization in the chat. Um, Saging International is an organization dedicated to um, helping those of us in, the, in our second half of life 
recognize that it can be a very purposeful time of life, a time where we um, embrace vitality and re recognize that we really have a contribution that we can be making, um, particularly once we um, perhaps are no longer caring for our families or working on a regular basis, or many people involved in Saging International are continuing to work. Um, and so it's an organization that really embraces both education, uh, deepening spiritually, and also service. And um, Alana, you're absolutely correct that Noemi um, epitomizes what we <laughs> tried to be talking about in Saging. Um, she really it was just an incredible role model, a wonderful friend, and I know um, without a doubt that she has changed my life by knowing her. Yeah. Diane, thank you so, so much. It's been such a pleasure to have the opportunity to talk with you and to share your new book. And um, we have the link to the book on our website. Uh, if you haven't read it yet, I encourage everyone here to check it out um, and check out Diane's website as well, with, which has lots more information on it so that you can dig a little deeper. And Diane, thank you again. Thank you so much, Alana. Bye-bye. Thank you to everyone for joining today's program. This program was recorded and you will find it on our website starting tomorrow. Please join us for our next Lunch and Learn program on September 6th with Beverly Silver, who will tell the stories of her parents who are both Holocaust survivors with very different experiences. Our Lunch and Learn programs are possible because of all of you and because we have a fantastic team at the Holocaust Center. Thank you to Richard Green, our museum and technology director, who is running the technical side of this show. And thank you to our CEO, Dee Simon, Lori Werschel Cohen, Paul Regelbrug, Jessica Michaels, Julia Thompson, Morgan Romero, Amanda Davis, Devonshire Lockey, and Katie Lawrence. Thank you again for joining today's program. We hope to see you at our next Lunch and Learn program on September 6th. And remember to keep on learning.